Saluete omnes, ego sum magistra hurt. Today I'll be explaining how to learn Latin by yourself as an autodidact. What is the most important thing to focus on? Is it writing out all the tables at the back of Wheelocks 200 times? Is it maintaining a daily streak on Duolingo? Or is it something completely different? This is the first of a two-part video series in which I'll cover everything you need to know about the autodidact Latin scene, from what's the cheapest way to learn Latin, to how to spot a cult and run from it. I'll be reading the first half of my 16,000 word essay, which you can read on my blog, link in the description. Let's get into it. Incipiamos. I started writing this essay, which grew to over 16,000 words, with the goal of explaining how to learn Latin on a budget in 2023, the most cost-effective autodidact strategies. But during its month-long writing process, the essay turned into How Not to Be Deceived by Well-Meaning but Terrible Language Learning Advice. Since both your money and your time are valuable, if you don't want to be working needlessly hard while learning Latin, this essay is for you. I also propose a strategy which legitimately costs zero dollars and zero cents, so stay tuned for that. In my previous posts, I listed all the places you can learn introductory Latin online with teachers who speak the language through both live classes and self-paced courses, and I made a video about it, linked right here. The average cost of the live courses was about $1,500 US, while the average cost of a self-paced course, one with pre-recorded video lessons, was about $500. For many learners in the community, even the relatively cheaper options for learning Latin with a teacher may be out of their price range, although there was one that was doing it for free. But that's why so many opt instead for teaching themselves Latin. By becoming autodidacts, self-teachers, they can save hundreds or potentially thousands of dollars. But many Latin autodidacts are vulnerable to being deceived by well-intentioned language advice which tells them to work hard at meaningless things, instead of focusing on truly communicative, meaningful, and beneficial activities. In this article, I will explain the difficulties facing autodidacts, debunk some language learning myths, define meaningful activities, and that's for the first half. This is the part one video. In the part two video, I'll outline five viable strategies for learning Latin and even talk about how cults of celebrity propagate misinformation and how to avoid being deceived by them. The difficulties of an autodidact. As a high school Latin teacher in my sixth year of teaching, I have a professional responsibility to learn how people learn languages and to let my practice be informed by genuine scholarship and not just heritage practices or hearsay. But it's taken me years to really open up to the field of second language acquisition scholarship and start to navigate what we have learnt so far on this topic. I'm not alone in this. I know there are many language teachers in both modern and ancient languages who have similarly struggled to connect their teaching practices with what our current research says. It is much easier to simply repeat practices we have inherited from other teachers or language learners than to question the effectiveness of established practices like vocabulary tests, grammar quizzes, reading aloud round robin style, reading aloud a role play scenario, and so on. This is a big problem for the public knowledge of language learning. School is often the only place where people have experienced any form of language learning, but the way that languages are taught in schools, even modern languages, is often more a product of tradition than reason. These traditions have been passed down and refined to suit the school environment, a place of constant tests and quizzes, school reports, parental expectations, grades, exams, and classroom behavioural problems. Unfortunately, the classroom experience of language learning distorts public ideas of what learning a language ought to look like. This is unhelpful to an autodidact for two reasons. Firstly, they are no longer in the classroom. Secondly, the practices are not always the most effective for language acquisition. Often, even the language teachers who are the most on board with SLA research are forced to compromise between best practices for actually learning a language and implementing a mixture of inherited practices that were fine-tuned for behaviour control and maximising test scores. It's therefore no wonder that the public flocks to apps like Duolingo. They have grown to expect that language learning is an inherently unpleasant experience, filled with rote learning, vocab tests, practicing verb conjugations, and translating isolated sentences into and out of the target language, or repeating boring stock answers to stock questions. 
If those unpleasant parts can be gamified to give you points and stars in an app, thus replacing the grade incentives that got you through school, then this app must have finally cracked the code for how to learn languages as adults. This is, of course, missing the point of what a language is. Learning a language is not just another version of learning your times tables in exchange for sweets, or learning a puzzle-solving algorithm to decode sentences from another language into your native language. Putting points and scores on an app doesn't change the fundamental nature of what that app provides. The question we should be asking is not whether a gamified language learning app succeeds at being addictive, but whether it provides meaningful activity in the language and how much compared to other ways we could use our time. I will not review Latin Duolingo here, but instead I want to encourage you all to look deeper into what it means to learn a language and to investigate what is really important and what is not. If you can understand the principles of language learning and what a language fundamentally is, you will be able to develop sustainable, satisfying language learning practices which are adapted for your situation. I encourage you not to label yourself as conservative or progressive before deep diving into how we learn languages. We're talking about a biological mechanism in our brains, how it works, and how we can give it the right conditions for language learning. This question is not a political or theological one, but a question of how our bodies and minds truly work, facts which affect people of all outlooks. Language Learning Principles This is my very short summary of the fundamental principles behind language learning. Number one, every human, unless they possess a language-related disability, has the necessary hardware to learn a language. You do not need to be exceptionally intelligent nor exceptionally diligent to learn a language. This is most obviously proven when you visit multilingual regions of the world. For example, my mother grew up in Malaysia, where she picked up five languages, English, Bahasa Malaysian, Mandarin, Cantonese, and Hokkien, only some of which were regularly spoken in her household. To her, it was nothing special to know these languages, because everyone in the community knew several languages. Multilingualism is the norm for most regions of the world outside of rich Western Anglophone countries. Therefore, the ability to learn multiple languages cannot be limited to individuals with genetically rare traits in the population, for it is not just the exceptionally intelligent nor the exceptionally diligent who successfully learn languages in multilingual countries. Number two, we have always learnt through input. We learn languages by understanding meaningful messages in the target language. Input is anything we interpret for meaning. It is what we read or listen to. It is also important that the input is understood by the learner. Exactly how much it needs to be comprehensible for input to count towards learning is debatable. Some say that the gist level comprehension is enough to make meaningful progress from input. Others say that optimal results happen at much higher levels of comprehensibility, where the learner knows 95% of the words in a text. Personally, I've experienced language growth at both levels. I've learnt valuable skills from input that I understood at the gist level, input that contained 95% known words, and input far below my level, which trains fluency with the existing knowledge. The comprehensible input hypothesis, now known more simply as the input hypothesis, was built upon the findings that the brain has an innate mechanism for learning language in natural circumstances, which can be effectively harnessed in second language acquisition. This internal language mechanism operates somehow separately from your conscious mind, a disconnect that we can directly confirm with evidence. As a language teacher, I have found that my students' scores in grammar tests have had little to no correlation to their scores in broader interpretive skills such as translation. This suggests that explicit knowledge of parts of the language is a separate beast from the actual ability to use and understand the language. Number three, input is a condition for learning, not a method. It may sound like I'm mincing words here, but this distinction is important. No textbook has an exclusive claim on being the comprehensible input method. It is often mistakenly believed that Hans Orberg's Lingua Latina per se illustrata familia romana is the comprehensible input method, 
In fact, Familia Romana was first published in 1957 under a different title before the input hypothesis was proposed. It literally could not have even been informed by the research around input. It was also not substantially revised to align with the input hypothesis. The revisions to the text in 1983 and 1991 are minor in nature and do not change its fundamental methodology. Counter to Nancy Llewellyn's speech in or out of Orberg, Orberg did not continuously refine it over 50 years of his lifetime any more than any textbook which gets republished every so often with new editions deserves the title continuously refined. If you don't believe me, just compare a 1957 copy of Lingua Latina Secundum Naturae Rationem Explicata to today's Familia Romana and try to find any meaningful differences in the method. But despite not being written with the input hypothesis and modern SLA research in mind, Familia Romana provides a lot of material that can be used as input. So do many other sources, which will be discussed below, both older and younger. Any textbook containing substantial Latin text can be used as a source for input, whether the book is written completely in Latin or not. And in fact, even textbooks in the grammar translation genre, such as Wheelock's Latin, provide a non-zero amount of input in the form of sentences used as exercises for translation. Although all grammar translation books contain much less input than the graded reader style textbooks. Input can even be directly taken from authentic texts under certain circumstances if they can be made sufficiently comprehensible to the learner, as we will see in the old interlinear method below. In sum, you do not have to adopt any particular textbook as a necessary consequence of accepting the input hypothesis, but it will be wise to pick resources and strategies which supply more input over those that supply less. Number four, everything works eventually. Since every method involves a non-zero amount of input, every method will eventually work with enough time spent on it. Some methods are just more time efficient than others, and some methods are more intrinsically enjoyable than others, leading to a higher likelihood that learners will persist with the method. When evaluating a language learning method, it is not meaningful to defend it on the basis of it worked for me, or it worked for so-and-so. Everything works if you try it for long enough. It doesn't need to be good to work, and many highly inefficient strategies propagate because the few people for whom it worked are the most vocal in telling everyone that it worked for them. Number five, nothing hurts. There is no language learning technique that will cause permanent damage to your language abilities. Yes, even translating in your head will not cause permanent damage. You do not need to force yourself to stop doing that. It will go away by itself. I know this because I did all the wrong things when I learned Latin. I translated everything, either on paper or in my head. Despite this, the inner translator voice eventually went away as I read more. We also do not need to fear language fossilization. Making mistakes early and not being immediately corrected on them will not damage your language journey in the long run. At most, you may develop a temporary misunderstanding in the language that will later be corrected from the overwhelming mass of input. You also don't have to master every lesson in the order predetermined by any textbook. It's okay if an apparently quote-unquote basic concept eludes you for a long time, Many of the grammar items considered basic to a language are in fact late acquired features because the order in which we have traditionally taught grammar does not correspond to the natural order in which grammar is actually acquired, and yet people still learn within these imperfect systems. Children don't need to master every feature in a perfectly orderly manner to make progress in language acquisition, and neither do you. The things that actually do stop people from reaching mastery in the language are loss of intrinsic motivation and lack of appropriate resources, which causes people to stall out and quit. Number six, you don't have to be young to acquire a language naturally. People often feel nervous about learning a language as an adult or even as a teenager because they think they've missed a critical window of time in which natural language acquisition is even possible. Granted, there are some reasons this idea exists. The first language acquisition process will not look the same as a second language acquisition process because the presence of another language in your brain changes how you approach the second one in both helpful and annoying ways. In addition, the activities which children are likely to do, playing in the park with other kids, using very basic language in a low-stress environment, are different from the language learning situations that adults find themselves in. 
But while adults will generally participate in different language activities compared to children, the underlying mechanism for acquiring a language remains more or less the same. There is no cut-off age for acquiring a language naturally as an adult through input. As an extreme counterexample, Steve Kaufman, who knows 20 languages, probably more by now, learnt more of them after turning 60 than in his youth. In 2022, when I was 30, I was self-learning Italian from scratch, mainly through watching TV shows, and I found that natural acquisition worked well, even though I'm not in my 20s anymore. You don't have to be a child to learn from input. Number seven, language acquisition is slow. Think about how long it takes for a baby to acquire their first language. They get constant input from loving parents who only speak in the target language or languages every day and every night. Even with that amount of language learning time, it takes them about two years before they can start stringing together very short sentences, often unintelligible. As adult learners, we have an advantage over infants in that we already have a fully functional first language and a longer attention span, but even for us, it takes a long time to see the fruits of language acquisition. It is possible to go from complete beginner to low intermediate in about a year of dedicated consistent study, say an hour every day. It's not really possible to go from complete beginner to high intermediate or advanced in just a year. There is no method which will speed up an inherently slow process like language acquisition except dedicating more time per day to meaningful activities in the target language. Number eight. It takes less time to reach the intermediate plateau than to leave the intermediate plateau. Language learning speed is not exactly linear. It starts off relatively fast, then slows down dramatically at the end of the beginner stage, and stays at that slower pace throughout the intermediate and advanced stages. While beginners can make relatively faster and more noticeable improvements in their language abilities, Intermediate learners struggle to see their progress and take a longer time to reach advanced levels than they had taken to reach intermediate levels. Consequently, if everything goes well, you'll be spending a lot less time in the beginner zone than you will in the intermediate zone. Given this perspective, it doesn't matter all that much how you reach the intermediate plateau. All beginner pathways will converge there eventually, and then you'll all be in the same boat, facing the same general difficulties in navigating intermediate content. So you don't have to stress so much if you took a less than optimal path through the beginner material. Regardless of how you reach the intermediate plateau, you will have to change tactics to accommodate its new challenges. Although intermediate learning is outside the scope of this article, I'll briefly state here that you'll most likely be reading extensively through intermediate level material, incorporating gradually more advanced texts with the help of tiered texts, interlinears, and or far style commentaries as needed. I'm working on an upcoming book for intermediate learners, a 30,000 word intermediate reader called The Lover's Curse, a tiered reader of Aeneid 4. Reading authentic texts with the help of easier Latin versions that render Virgil's poetry comprehensible is a great way to extend your skills as an intermediate learner, and I'll be distributing free digital copies of it upon release to anyone who signs up to my Latin email newsletter. But for beginner learners, this is our main takeaway. What you do to get yourself from beginner to intermediate has less and less effect on your final language level the longer you keep learning at the intermediate and advanced levels. Now that we have some idea of what language learning constitutes, I want to focus on the most important thing you should do when learning a language. Meaningful activity in the language. If there is only one thing you do every day in your language study, it should be meaningful activity. Language is a system of words and grammatical forms, taken together as forms, which are used to express meaning, a human thought, a command, an outcry of delight, a lament, an evaluation, a story. Interpreting and expressing meaning is fundamental to the nature of language and how we most effectively learn it. Our brains have been learning language through understanding input for, presumably, as long as we have had languages. People who grow up in multilingual parts of the world effectively learn multiple languages without considering it anything special, because they use the languages as languages, systems of communicating meaning. 
If we want to take full advantage of the very part of the brain which is best suited to learning languages, we should be focusing most of our time on doing meaningful activity in the language, activities which require us to either interpret or express meaning or both. This is the core of the communicative approach. We can prove that meaningless activities are not necessary for language acquisition because human beings of all cultures instinctively recoil from meaningless activity, while only in some language learning cultures do people actually bother with meaningless activity. I know that my mother growing up in Malaysia did not do any flashcards, deliberate grammar study, or fill in the blank exercises because when I asked her how she learned her five languages, she said she couldn't remember how she did it. If she had worked away at any meaningless activity to acquire the languages that weren't normally spoken in her home, she would have remembered it. By contrast, meaningful activity is essential to language learning because making form meaning connections is the basis of learning a language. Any activity which does not genuinely engage with meaning is missing a crucial element. In order to associate all the various words, phrases, grammar, and syntax with their meaning, we need to encounter them many times in contexts where their meaning matters. Meaningful input. A meaningful input activity is one in which meaning is so intrinsically bound to the activity itself that you cannot succeed at the activity without understanding the meaning expressed by a source text. For example, if your task is to evaluate which retelling of a myth you find more entertaining, you cannot successfully make a comparison between the two texts without understanding at least part of what is expressed in both texts. An input activity can also be shown to be inherently meaningful if there is a positive relationship between how much you understand the language involved and how much you succeed at the task. For example, you could succeed at creating a surface level comparison of the two texts if you only understood a little of each. But you can make a better comparison of the two texts the more you understand of them. By contrast, meaningless activities are possible to complete without understanding meaning, and the success of the activity does not correlate positively with how much you understand. For example, you might be told to read a story out loud in full before understanding it, but it is very possible to read something aloud and understand literally nothing in it. The mere act of vocalizing something does not guarantee that you have processed any of it. In fact, you may be processing less of it in that activity because you have to split your attention between carefully pronouncing words and trying to understand the actual story. Especially if you're reading in front of other people, you can completely mind blank on what you just said aloud, which requires you to do a second reading in your head to actually understand the text, revealing that the first reading was pretty pointless. You may be training your pronunciation in that activity, or your recitation skills, or public speaking, but it doesn't help you in progressing towards actually understanding the language. The success condition of the read it aloud in one go activity is that you confidently vocalize a story from start to finish out loud without stopping or repeating yourself. Someone who does this with optimal pronunciation and no interruptions does not necessarily understand the story better than someone who mumbles, stops, butchers the pronunciation, and trails off while thinking about the story. Therefore, the activity of reading aloud a new story in one go is not intrinsically tied to how well you process the meaning of the story. It is not a meaningful activity. That doesn't mean that the entire category of reading aloud is meaningless. For example, whisper reading, a practice where you murmur the words aloud to yourself while focusing chiefly on the meaning of what you're reading, permitting yourself to stop and think and reread sentences wherever necessary and not worrying too much about how well you produce sounds, is essentially the same as reading for meaning, but with the additional support of letting yourself murmur the words, which some people may find helpful for their focus. For every example that I list as a meaningless activity, you could probably come up with a similar practice which does involve meaningful processing of the language. My intention in providing a list of examples and counterexamples is to train you to discern the difference between a meaningful activity and one which is mostly busy work or a distraction. You also don't have to do all of the meaningful activities I suggest. These are just illustrations of the type of activity that compels you to interpret meaning. Here are some examples of meaningful input activities. 
Read a Latin story and understand it. Watch a Latin video and enjoy the substance of what it is saying. Listen to an audio recording of Latin while doing chores, and at least part of the time you catch what's being said and understand what it means. The more you catch, the better. Read a Latin story, sometimes using an English translation to help you understand what the Latin says, while gradually looking more at the Latin half than the English half as you progress with the goal of getting more engrossed in the Latin story. Reread a story you had previously read and see how much of it you can remember and if your memory of the story is confirmed in this rereading. Read two versions of the same story or myth in Latin and evaluate which version you prefer. Listen to a podcast in which you can understand at least some of what is being said and can follow the gist of the conversation. Occasionally you laugh when the speakers laugh because you actually get their jokes. Read or listen to questions about a story you read in Latin, understand the questions and answer them either mentally with a gesture, e.g. a nod or a head shake, or aloud in English or Latin. Read a flashcard showing a sentence from a story you have previously read with the target word highlighted. Recall what the sentence means and remember where it came from in the story and check to see if you've understood the target word. Reader's theatre. Take some time to consider how you could read aloud a character's dialogue in a way that expresses their emotions in the scene. As you reread the text, think about which lines and which words should be emphasised and why. Then perform the dialogue like a voice actor. You may choose to record your goofy voice and listen to it again later. The following activities are not ones which require you to meaningfully process input. Before understanding what it says, read aloud a text in one go, carefully thinking about your pronunciation. Take turns in a group, reading aloud a text, round-robin style. Search a text for examples of words in the genitive case by looking for words which end in the letters A-E, A-R-U-M, I, O-R-U-M, I-S, or U-M, and label them all as genitive. Solve an exercise like Julius et Aemilia in will blank habit blank cum liber blank et serv blank by finding a matching sentence in the text and copying across the endings without processing the meaning. Answer a Latin comprehension question, e.g. Num pastor solus in campo est? by finding a language chunk in the story that matches it and copying it verbatim as an answer to the question without understanding the meaning of the question or answer. Review a flashcard which has one word on the front, is, er, id, and saying to yourself the English translation, he, she, it, that, and then do this with 20 other flashcards taken from the top 1,000 words without context. Listen to a song in Latin for entertainment and sing along, even though you have no idea what the Latin means. Mm -hmm. I put both symbols next to the last activity because it doesn't quite fit in either category. It's very possible to enjoy a song for its music while understanding literally none of the lyrics, so it fails the first criterion of a meaningful input activity by allowing zero comprehension to be a successful state. However, the more you understand of the lyrics, the more you can appreciate the way the song is crafted as a unified piece of art involving both music and language. As long as the song expresses meaningful thought with its words, it is inherently motivating the listener to search for the meaning of its messages. Nevertheless, songs like poetry tend to use rare and peculiar words for effect, which usually makes them rather unsuitable as beginner material. This doesn't mean we should avoid listening to songs, just that we need to temper our expectations about what they can do for our language growth, at least in the beginner zone. Songs aside, most of the activities I have listed as meaningless busy work tend to be quite mechanical and dull, whereas the activities I listed as meaningful input activities find their success in the simple pleasure of understanding meaning in the language and are tied to a meaningful context. This is a win-win for us language learners. It turns out that the most valuable activities that you want to spend most of your time doing in language are also the ones which are the most inherently enjoyable. And I don't mean enjoyable in the same way that winning a lottery is enjoyable. Reading a language book in bed is not going to suddenly spike your dopamine like consuming a can of fizzy sugar water, but it gives you a similar level of wholesome pleasure as taking a walk in the sunshine or chatting with friends. (laughs) 
Understanding meaning in another language is a simple pleasure that we can nurture and cultivate, turning it into a habit we actually want to do. Keep this in mind when we later discuss the pitfalls of language learning methods which require the learner to repeatedly complete frustrating tasks as if they were unavoidable facts of life. Now, since it is 2023, someone's going to ask whether AI tools such as ChatGPT can be a good source of input. My short answer is that the Latin produced by ChatGPT in 2023 is riddled with errors of grammar and idiom in almost every sentence, making it unsuitable for autodidacts. In the future, these tools will probably become more accurate, at which point we could start talking about whether humans fundamentally prefer listening to humans, robots, or a combination of the two. In the hands of an advanced Latinist, ChatGPT does an adequate job of generating rough drafts for stories which can be edited for both accuracy and better storytelling. This is how I've used it in my classes so far. I make it draft stories which I fix up for my students. But without that human intervention, it is just not a source that a beginner Latinist can trust in 2023. Now that we've discussed meaningful input, let's turn to meaningful output. Meaningful output. For some reason, even more than with input-based tasks, our Latin community is prone to recommend output activities which do not actually require meaningful communicative intent. It almost seems like output activities get a free pass of approval. The mere fact that certain activities involve speaking or writing of any kind, even if it is a purely mechanical exercise with a predetermined correct answer, attracts positive labels like active Latin, in contrast to the negative label of passive Latin that is applied to, presumably, input-based activities. In reality, SLA researchers do not divide the world of language learning into active meaning good and passive meaning bad. They do talk about the receptive modes of listening and reading in contrast to the productive modes of speaking and writing, but no one's trying to claim that receptive modes are truly passive, somehow involving no activity from the brain to process. Communication doesn't just mean talking to each other. It includes all forms of the interpretation and expression of meaning. Reading is a communicative act. Listening is a communicative act. What makes the act communicative is the interpretation or expression of meaning, not whether words come out of your mouth or ink comes out of your pen. But it must be asked, what value does the language learner gain from producing output? There is a long-standing debate among SLA researchers about the role which output should play in language learning, and this is worth considering. Positions vary from those who believe output is unnecessary and who claim input alone is sufficient for developing a functional proficiency in the target language, to those who believe that output is necessary for a fully rounded and more deeply interconnected understanding of the language. On the side of those claiming that input is sufficient for language development, there are notable cases of people who developed a sophisticated comprehension of their target language through years of purely input-based activities. Matt vs. Japan learned Japanese to a very high level, largely through watching entertainment media, and reported that he only needed a couple weeks of practice to activate his wide knowledge to speak Japanese to other people. But in my experience, moving from being a silent Latinist to a speaking Latinist, I've found that converting receptive knowledge of the language into productive skills requires a substantial amount of rewiring the connections between your thoughts and words. Recalling or retrieving a word that you only know at sight is like tracing the connections backwards. Activating your knowledge of the language is an ongoing process, not something which you can instantly carry over from your reading comprehension. One thing is clear, if you do create output, you should expect the complexity of what you can produce to be lower than the complexity of what you can comprehend. It is through comprehending input that humans gradually build a mental representation of the language, a complex systematic image of what exists in Latin. Output is what we can produce by attaching active recall connections to what we've already learnt. Therefore, we cannot produce output unless we have ingested sufficient input. Because of this, you should not be expecting yourself to produce output at the same level of complexity as the input you are currently receiving, and input should precede output. 
but not all Latinists even say that they want to produce output at all. If one is content to simply consume and not produce, is output a necessary and essential part of the language learning process? Merrill Swain's output hypothesis, which makes several claims for why output is beneficial and even essential to the language learning process, was originally developed because she observed that second language French immersion students had a very high level of comprehension in French from receiving ample input, but lagged behind their native speaking peers in their ability to speak in French. I'm willing to bet that many Latinists would in fact be perfectly content to be those French immersion students Swain was dissatisfied with, who had high comprehension but little productive ability, because they are happy not to speak or write in Latin. Even if output can be shown to have some beneficial impact on comprehension, it seems that input alone is already capable of taking people to high levels of comprehension, the one skill that seems relevant in Latin. Why then should we bother producing output? It is beyond the scope of this essay to fully articulate the reasons our community should or should not be encouraging productive Latin, but I heavily suspect that some of the fear and bitter resistance towards output in Latin may actually be a consequence of how forced, meaningless output practice in school language classes has left many people with a strong dislike of the practice, prompting them to seek out Latin precisely because it is a language that no one has to speak. If that is the case, then recommending cookie-cutter activities taken from forced productive practices in language classes is the absolute worst way to promote active Latin as it will instantly reinforce the natural and cultivated dislike of being made to talk empty words for the sake of language practice. Fundamentally, human beings don't have a natural dislike of speaking. We dislike being forced to speak without any good reason. It would be much more beneficial if we thought of things the other way around. You don't have to speak and write in Latin. You get to speak and write in Latin. All of that lifetime knowledge of the language you're carefully building up Instead of dying with it and taking it all to the grave, you get to pass it to the next generation through the natural mechanisms of output and interaction, by talking and writing and collaborating with other people in Latin. The better your output proficiency gets, the more you can help other people enjoy the language that you enjoy, whether you are a teacher, creative writer, or just an average person who participates in a group chat once in a while. Have you noticed how intrigued and inspired young people get when they see living people speak a dead language? In an age where old content gets buried under mountains of new content every single day, people who produce Latin are making our language seen and heard, especially by the younger generations. But productive ability doesn't appear overnight, like language acquisition itself, Learning to be a good speaker or writer in the language is a long process. Most of what you write or say from the beginning will be full of errors, including both obvious grammatical errors and more subtle problems with the idiom. It is important not to fixate on errors initially, but instead to learn how to use the resources you have available to make yourself understood by other people and build competency from there. Meaningful output activities, where the focus is on communicating information to a sympathetic listener rather than on avoiding errors, are the most effective ways to build this resourcefulness. For an output activity to be meaningful, you need to be able to answer two questions, taking from Henshaw and Hawkins' language pedagogy book Common Ground. What information or content is being conveyed? And... What will the audience do with the information? Communicative output activities require an audience that cares more about what you are saying than how well you are saying it. You can find sympathetic Latin speakers on the Latin subreddit, on various Latin Discord servers such as the General Latin Discord and the Lingua Latina Per Se Illustrata Discord, on weekly Latin Zoom chats, and by writing a post in the Latin subreddit asking if there are any Latin speakers in your city or local area. Try contacting the nearest university that teaches Latin to ask if there's a local Latin club. You can even directly hire Latin speaking tutors on italki. Here are some examples of meaningful output activities. In Latin, command other people to do the actions you tell them to do, e.g. 
Weni hook e da mi hikalaum. Gratias tibi. Then swap roles. To prepare for the activity, you may create a printout with pictures captioned with example commands in Latin to serve as a visual reminder for yourself and others. Write new Latin comprehension questions about a story you've read, which you will share with friends as an activity to check their reading comprehension. Respond to Latin comprehension questions in Latin by writing answers, then indicate which question was the most and least interesting to answer. Compare your opinions with other learners and collaborate to write better questions to replace the ones which were considered the least interesting. Write alternative ways to rephrase parts of a story from your textbook so that you can later read that story to other people in a Latin study group and explain it aloud in Latin using these variations in phrasing for clarification. Write a variation of a Latin story you've read in a textbook, but replace the main characters with you and your friends or characters from memes and change some of the events or the outcome of the story. Then share it with your friends and see if they enjoy it. Collaborate with another Latinist to create illustrated children's stories. Each person writes a story from your home culture, and the other person draws illustrations. Team up with an advanced Latinist to check your idiom, and then share the stories on the Latin subreddit with their pictures. Prepare dot points in Latin about how you would introduce yourself to new people. Then, at a Latin speaking group, such as at a weekly Zoom meeting, Introduce yourself to the group using the script you've prepared while also venturing off script to say more or clarify things if people don't seem to understand. Join a Latin speaking group and contribute meaningfully to the conversation, even if you just start by saying short phrases like Elge, hooray, pro dolor, oh, what an unfortunate thing, or mihi plaket, I like, blah, 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 while others do more of the talking. In a Latin Discord server chat, Read what other people are writing and then ask other people in Latin to tell you more details about what they're talking about if it's a topic that interests you. In a Latin Discord server chat, when people ask you to explain or clarify what you mean, find a way to make your meaning clearer by giving examples or using different phrases. In text chat or voice chat, ask a Latin speaker about their family or what they do every day. Discuss how your families or daily routines are similar or different. Each of these suggested output activities may be suited for different levels. Activities which involve making lists, short utterances, or minor alterations to existing content are the most accessible to beginners, while activities which involve intricate description or sustained logical argument are more suited to speakers at higher levels. Some output tasks can be done away from a human community. An audience can include yourself if you find writing to yourself therapeutic, or God if you are religious. Reflection, gratitude, and prayer can be meaningful practices in which the main goal is to use language to express the content, rather than to avoid making errors. If you're the kind of person who normally keeps a diary, try journaling in Latin to see what thoughts come to the surface. Do you think or feel differently in Latin than you do in your native language? Gratitude journal. In Latin, make a dot point list of things which you appreciate in life. Then write a prayer or a gratitude journal entry, summing up this list and expressing thanks for these blessings. Scripture reflection and prayer. Read a passage from Holy Scripture. Outline in short dot points what the passage might have meant for its original audience. Reflect on what wisdom it may bring to our current context. Write or say a prayer asking for God's help in applying the wisdom of this passage to our everyday lives. The following activities are not examples of meaningful output. Take a sentence from a text and turn every singular plural, every plural singular. Take a story and rewrite it in a different tense, keeping everything else the same. Take a sentence from the text and retell it using an accusative and infinitive indirect statement. Read aloud the script of a role play, taking turns in a group to pronounce aloud your assigned lines, while not getting the other people to meaningfully act upon the information you are saying aloud. Copy out a Latin story from the textbook in your own handwriting. Transcribe a text from an audio recording. Translate isolated random English sentences 
e.g. those sourced from a prose composition book, into Latin. Take an English translation of a Latin text and translate it back into Latin, checking to see where your version and the authentic text differs. Commit a text to memory and recite it aloud from memory. Mimic an audio recording by repeating aloud what it says. These activities lack a meaningful communicative purpose. You're not conveying information to an audience who will listen and act upon what you say to them. They are practice for practice's sake, and not a true substitute for the real thing that practice is supposed to be bringing you towards. Some people will defend these practice activities by saying that a beginner has to start somewhere. It is unrealistic to expect beginners to produce meaning in the language. There is some unspecified amount of time beginners need to practice before doing something real. They may say that most people don't have anyone to talk to in Latin anyway, so this is how they can train themselves to be ready for meeting someone to talk to, some distant day in the future. This is wrong on several counts. Firstly, we have already shown several examples of meaningful output activities that learners can start to take part in even before they gain command of creating original full sentences. Activities involving creating lists, making short utterances, or recycling material from text or other speakers' words are accessible output activities for novice-level speakers. Secondly, I've already explained several practical ways to find Latin speakers both online and in person. Meeting someone you can speak Latin with is easier today than it has been for a very, very long time. This is coming from someone who lives in Australia, which is about as geographically far from the European and American conventicula as you can get. Thirdly, mandating that beginners pre-train their accuracy before they start meaningfully communicating sends the damaging message that you ought to be very sure of what you say before you dare open your mouth to speak. In reality, if you must wait until your output is reliably accurate and beautiful before you start speaking, you will never be ready to speak, because it takes lots of experience communicating in realistic situations before you can begin to produce high-quality output in realistic situations. Rather than focusing initially on accuracy, beginners should focus on being intelligible with the resources that they have, and then work to improve their proficiency from that baseline. As Henshaw and Hawkins write in Common Ground, Novice and intermediate learners require a sympathetic interlocutor rather than a red pen. Back translation, grammar manipulation exercises, and Latin prose composition provide the red pen of corrective feedback, but not the sympathetic interlocutor who listens and responds. While such communicatively pointless exercises may practice active recall and highlight gaps in ability, they do so at the cost of being intrinsically demotivating and inhibiting for most human beings, who seek to be heard and seen for their meaningful contribution, rather than ignored for content and scrutinized for errors. It is no surprise, then, that the casually successful multilinguals of the world who pick up local languages like Hokkien and Cantonese don't bother with the equivalence of prose composition exercises, but just get down to meaningful communication with real people. These empty activities also perpetuate unrealistic expectations of what output should look like during the learning process. Ordinary people, under natural circumstances, do not produce output as beautifully perfect as the chapter they are up to in Familia Romana, but artificial production activities keyed to each chapter clearly assume that they should. For a more realistic view of the productive capabilities of learners, we can read modern language standards such as the ACTFL Proficiency Guidelines for Novice, Intermediate, and Advanced Learners. Novices are clearly described as not yet having full command of the sentence. They, quote, communicate short messages primarily through the use of isolated words and phrases, end quote. They are often unintelligible. Quote, novice level speakers may be difficult to understand even by the most sympathetic interlocutors accustomed to non-native speech, end quote. The goal of a novice level speaker is not to immediately start producing perfect output, but to move step by step towards the next rung of the ladder 
intermediate level proficiency, which features full sentences that are more intelligible to other speakers. Intermediate level proficiency is itself not error free, as, quote, patterns of error appear, unquote, even as late as advanced high. The bottom line is that becoming competent at producing output is a process that takes time. So if we need to do a lot of it, we would be better off enjoying it. Would you rather embark on an indefinite amount of meaningless practice devoid of a communicative context that may or may not help your productive skills in realistic situations, or would you rather cultivate meaningful communication with real people? Intrinsic motivation and enjoyment are just as crucial in the output activities as they are in the input activities, because in the long term, we are more likely to sustain the habits that we enjoy. Share in the comments if I've just stomped all over your favorite activity by calling it not communicative, or if it has been a weight off your chest to know like, I don't have to read out loud everything that I see. I can just read. But stay tuned because in part two, I'm going to share the top five strategies for learning Latin as an autodidact, what step-by-step processes you can go through yourself. Walete omnes. Amici, esterni. Don't you